Um, it's Monday the 16th of um, September and I'm here with Bernard O'Donoghue. And I'm about to, um, to, to have some, some thoughts about Seamus Heaney, who uh, was died last month, so it's all very kind of raw in everybody's head still. <clears throat> um, I remember uh, in a Sunday Times review of Heaney in the 1980s, John Carey said memorably, we're lucky to be alive while he is writing. It'd be hard to think of a stronger accolade, and it's one that most readers of poetry would agree with. To live through a critical lifetime from the 1960s to the first decade of the 21st century and watch Heaney's many books appearing was an exhilarating experience. I want to consider, though, why exactly we were lucky to watch Heaney's corpus taking shape, his in particular. Many things come to mind, of course, the extraordinary exactness and rightness of his descriptive language, whether describing blackberries or grains of corn flowing through your fingers or fragments of burning paper floating in the wind or a 56-pound weight. A recent elegiac piece in Time magazine compared him to Chekhov in his capacity to say something extraordinary by simply describing ordinary things. Then there's the importance of his readiness to deal with public subjects in Ireland and beyond, his readiness to face the neighbourly murder that occurred in his native province, his catching of the moment of 9-11 and his Horace translation, Anything Can Happen, a poem which generated immediately a worldwide set of translations of Heaney's version. The seriousness of the subjects he dealt with and the eloquent power he brought to the discussion of them made him the outstanding poet in English of his time. He was not a moralizer; he was too forgivingly alert to human frailty for that, but the moral sense is present in everything he wrote. So it is not surprising that his poetry earned him the Nobel Prize for Literature, or that the Nobel Citation praised his poetry's combination of lyrical beauty and ethical depth, which exalt everyday miracles and the living past. But we can recognize and admire these qualities, these facts about his writing without exactly feeling lucky to be reading them as they appeared. So what was most extraordinary about him? I think it was this. We expect the great writers, Dante, Milton, Yeats, Joyce, to be overfacing. We expect to feel shy in their presence, to feel inadequate. We don't exactly think of them as good company, but Seamus Heaney was wonderful company. He made everyone feel good. How many people of all capacities or limitations have we met who said, I enjoyed meeting Seamus, I think there was a real understanding between us. And it was always Seamus. He was everyone's possession, something he put up with with great good humour. How he managed to make time for everyone in this way is a mystery. To do that, and at the same time to write some of the greatest poetry of the modern era. We've listened to part of Casualty, the haunting poem in which the poet talks in the pub with the local fisherman, feeling shy of condescension. Here we meet the same gift. Call it warmth or empathy or sheer human skill that appears in one of the beautiful sonnets in memory of his mother in clearances in the hall lantern. The mother shared at the beginning of one of the poems the fear of affectation that made her affect inadequacy whenever it came to pronouncing words beyond her. The son governed his tongue in front of her, a genuinely well-adjusted, adequate betrayal of what I knew better. And of course, they're both playing the same game. They're avoiding pretension and affectation. Seamus Heaney always spoke up for poetry. It's one of the countless reasons that his loss is so grievous. But he also always said, that he couldn't have written his poetry if he didn't know that poetry was not the most important thing in the world. A principle of reserve that he had inherited from his farming forebears, he said. He couldn't have written the great tormented poems of North that faced the horrors of the time so squarely without that inheritance. So he was able to deal with every situation and every linguistic idiom and register that was wanted. I once heard him say he was built like a badger, square-shouldered. And I'd like to finish by quoting the end of his poem, Badgers, which begins with the poet, half lit with whiskey, whiskey with the Irish E in it, and ends with another of his great questions. How perilous is it to choose not to love the life we're shown? His sturdy, dirty body and interloping grovel, 
the intelligence in his bone, the unquestionable houseboy's shoulders that could have been my own. Again, puzzle me the right answer to that one. We were lucky to live while he was writing because he posed all the great questions better than anyone else. And now we're left to pose them and attempt to answer them without him. You've spoken very eloquently there, Bernard, about Seamus as, as a poet. Um, I'm wondering if you might be able to share a few um, thoughts on him as, as a friend, as, as someone that you knew personally. Well, um, I got to know him fairly well. Um, not, not his very closest friends, as it were, but I got to know him well in the period when he was the professor of poetry, of poetry uh, in Oxford from 1989 to 94 and saw him a lot, I mean, several times every year and of course he was he was wonderful company and it was uh, it was wonderful to have him uh, to have him around uh, around the college I was in Magdalen College um, and of course it was wonderful to have this kind of Irish underwriting you know to have a, a major admired venerated Irish presence there it was very very nice you know for the for, for the Irish often when we kind of think of an overview of his um, poetry the, the the things that become memorable sometimes are the tragedy from them yes. And, yes. and you've, you've written yourself about that notion of, of the classical tragic kind of vein within his work. Yes, that's right. I mean, yeah, he's, 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 he, I mean that's what I meant about the moral sense in a way. He's got, he's got a tremendously strong kind of tragic and, and moral motivation. But he's a person of extreme light spirits you know, as well. I mean, he said uh, in an interview with Mer Melvin Bragg in 1990, I think he said, 1991, he said, um, my my temper is not Brechtian. He's not naturally, by nature, a kind of, you know, public writer. But the circumstances kind of um, uh, brought that about, you know. Um, I, remember, I remember once he, um, when I was in Dublin a few years ago, he drove me and a few other people to Glasnevin to show us around the, you know, the, 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 um, the graveyard with the, um, the, with the literary associations, Joyce's parents and uh, Hopkins and so on. It's an incredibly moving place, you know. But as we were going there for this this extremely moving experience, he was playing the goon show in the, in the car, you know, and you're know, banging the dashboard himself and, and, uh, and kind of... You know, singing along with echoes. You know, he was he was terrific fun to be with. 